Hey everyone, I hope you made it through Fides et Ratio without too much trouble. Um, I know this is probably more difficult than what you're used to, and that's okay. This is why we take notes. This is why we discuss the readings in class. So don't stress out if you had a problem with Fides et Ratio or if you struggled through Fides et Ratio, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We will read many more selections like this in the future. So even though this one may have been difficult for you, the coming ones may not be so difficult because you will begin to get used to this level of reading. I promise you it will get easier and we'll work on it together throughout the year. Um, Fides et Ratio was written by St. John Paul II and released in September 14th, 1998. For testing purposes, don't stress out about the date. Um, you do need to know the author, you do need to know the title, and you do need to know the translation of the title, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, but you do not need to know the date in which it was released. So a little bit of background about St. John Paul II. Um, St. John Paul II was Pope from 1978 to 2005. He was the first non-Italian Pope um, in over 400 years, I mean, at the time he was elected which is actually a pretty big deal. Um, if you don't know anything about um, papal politics, um, having a pope elected uh, who was a non-Italian was actually extremely shocking, extremely surprising. Um, pope John Paul II was uh, Polish, and he was also one of the longest reigning popes that we've ever had in history. He was canonized by Pope Francis in 2014, and he's also known as St. John Paul the Great, um, or you know, St. Pope John Paul the Great. Um, and he's called the, he's referred to as the great because he was so influential in the lives of so many um, and he was so influential in the direction of, that the church took during his papacy. There are some popes, I guess if you study the history of the papacy, there are some popes that kind of um, just ride the tide, I guess, and just kind of let the church go in the direction that it's going. But St. John Paul really changed the direction and, and brought the modern church to or brought the church to the modern era in terms of the younger generations. He appealed to the youth and he really, I mean, I think he was the, the starter of World Youth Day. So if you ever um, know anyone who's been to World Youth Day, that's a big deal. Um, he also expounded on extremely important issues in the church. Um, he was influential in bringing down the fall of, in bringing down communism. So if you ever talk about the fall of communism, you, you will always talk about John Paul. Um, in reference to the fall of com communism. Um, and he also was influential in speaking out against injustices in the world. He was famous, I guess, or infamous for um, speaking out against capital punishment, euthanasia, or physician-assisted suicide, um, I guess nuclear warfare and abortion. All of these things we'll talk about in the spring. But he was quite charismatic and quite I guess, a very feisty person. So um, when he saw an injustice, he made sure that he spoke out against it and he did what he could to stop it. Um, in terms of Fides et Ratio, we're starting with Fides et Ratio because it is essential to understanding theology or the truths that are found in Fides et Ratio are essential to understanding theology. Fides et Ratio is Latin. Um, Fides et Ratio is an encyclical. You should remember what an encyclical is from your freshman and sophomore years of theology. In case you don't remember, an encyclical is a letter from the Pope written to the rest of the church or the rest of the world. Um, an encyclical really is the Pope's a chance to speak out on issues that he sees or issues that are concerning him. Um, and so in Fides et Ratio, Pope John Paul II addressed this cultural desire to separate faith and reason. And if you notice the translation of the encyclical, Fides et Ratio translates into faith and reason. So in the, the overarching concept of this encyclical is the Pope trying to express to the rest of the world that both faith and reason are essential to understanding the truth of human existence. So before we jump into the reading itself, or the selections from the reading, I wanted to draw your attention to the chapter titles. These are selections from the encyclical Fides et Ratio. I did not give you the entire document. I just gave you some selections, some important paragraphs that I wanted you to cover. Um, but I, it kept John Paul's chapter titles. 
So if you notice, each chapter has a different title. Chapter two is Credo Ut Intelligam. Chapter three is Intelligo Ut Credam. So I was not expecting you to know what those Latin phrases meant, but I was hoping that you looked them up. And that's part of annotating is that you look up things that you don't understand or that you don't know what they mean. So credo ut intelligam means I believe so that I may understand. And intelligo ut credam is I understand so that I may believe. And this is really, I guess, the crux of what he is trying to portray with this reading is that when you are a person of faith, your faith is not silly. Your faith is not childish. Your faith, rather, should be educated. Your faith should be logical. Your faith should be reasonable. That it is logical, it is reasonable to believe in what God has revealed. It is logical to believe in God. It's lo Yeah, it's logical to believe in God himself. I mean, I don't know if you remember from your freshman year in theology where we covered the five proofs of God's existence that are outlined by Thomas Aquinas. Those proofs are logical proofs. They're, it is reasonable to believe that God exists. And so John Paul argues that faith and reason work together to help the human being achieve the truth or understand the truth about life itself, that you cannot have one without the other. So let's start with the document itself. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth, in a word, to know himself, to know God himself, so that men and women may also come to know the fullness of truth about themselves. So John Paul argues that before we can really understand what it means to be human, we must first understand the truth that God has revealed, to know God, to know and love God himself. So I'm going to give you, I guess, a little bit of a, of a, you know, something to think about with this, with this, this image that John Paul provides. He talks about faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth. It asks us, or places at least in my mind, this idea of a bird, I guess a dove, right? I have a picture here on the PowerPoint of, you know, a dove. Um, and obviously that makes me think of the Holy Spirit, you know, the dove, that's sort of the biblical um, representation of, of the Holy Spirit as a dove in some places in the New Testament. But when I'm thinking about faith and reason, and this is kind of silly, okay, and you're going to laugh, and I know it's not high theology, but that's okay. It's going to help you understand this analogy. Um, so if you have a bird, okay, that has, a, a bird is meant to have two wings, right? And what are the purpose, what's the purpose of those wings? To help the bird fly, right? That's what birds are supposed to do. They're supposed to fly. Um, they're supposed to, you know, hop a certain way, move a certain way, and the wings are there to help the bird achieve what it's supposed to be, right? So what happens if the bird somehow got into an accident, okay, and one of the wings was damaged and the bird couldn't use that wing anymore? What would happen to that bird? Would the bird die? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Okay. But if I had a bird that hurt his wing and I took him to the vet and the vet, you know, gave him antibiotics. Okay. He's good to go. He's not going to die. If he loses a wing, he's not going to die. But is he ever going to live a fully functional, fully happy bird life without both of his wings? No, because what is a bird supposed to do? It's supposed to fly unless you're a penguin. <laughs> okay, then you're not going to fly <laughs> or an ostrich or any one of those things. But if you are a typical bird, okay, or a dove, and we actually we remove one of your wings, this dove is no longer going to live a fully functional and fulfilled dove life. Okay, and I know it sounds silly, and I cannot imagine that John Paul was thinking about this particular um, this particular story. I'm sure he would laugh at it if he heard me say it. But um, if you removed one of the bird's wings, it would be detrimental to the existence of the bird itself because the bird needs two wings. That's what it needs. The wings are there for a reason. Same thing with faith and reason in human life. A human will not live a fully fulfilled or happy human life unless he or she has both faith and reason in his life or her life. That human beings, because of the way we were made, we need both faith and reason to live 
a full human life. So I did not give you this particular selection or this particular paragraph from Fides et Ratio, but the introduction to Fides et Ratio, if you look at the entire document, um, the introduction is titled Know Thyself. And Know Thyself is, I mean, for those of you who've studied philosophy, which are, is none of you, <laughs> none of you have studied philosophy before, um, you know, here at St. Pius, but if you do study philosophy, you would know that um, this this phrase, know thyself, or this command to know thyself, was carved into the um, entrance of the Temple of Apollo um, at Delphi, and it's also said to be one of the um, one of the utterings of the Oracle at Delphi, one of the you know quote unquote prophets. And so John Paul points out that in in all all of the cultures of the world in every age in every history even you know dating back to the ancient greeks greek philosophers in greek cultures every culture every history has sought the truth of human existence every human being that has ever existed has also sought the truth of human existence. And we seek out this truth in so many different ways. And I mean, think about it even now, maybe you have never ever thought to yourself that you are contemplating the truth of human existence, but you are. When you think to yourself, why am I here? Why do I exist? What am I supposed to do with my life? What do I want from life? Those are your the ways in which you contemplate what it means for you to be human. And John Paul says, the more human beings know reality and the world, the more they know themselves and their uniqueness. Know thyself is a basic truth to be adopted as a minimal norm by those who seek to set themselves apart from the rest of creation as human beings. Again, this is not part of the homework that I gave you, but it's extremely important. It's extremely to important to point out at the beginning of a theological class that the more you study the world, the more you should realize how unique you are as a human being. I'm going to say that again. The more you study the world, the more you should realize how unique you are as a human being, that you are vastly different than anything else that exists. It frustrates me so much to see, you know, the, the culture today treating human beings like they're nothing more than a bag of organs or, you know, a, a sack of organs, because that's not what you are. That there is something so unique about being human that that cultures and civil entire civilizations have tried and failed to define what it means to be human. That really, the only person who ever, ever correctly and accurately defined what it meant to be human was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, of course, was also divine, so human and divine. That entire, I'm going to say that again, entire civilizations have tried and failed to de define what it means to be human, but Jesus Christ succeeded. And the church has picked up where what Jesus Christ has succeeded and brought that to us in the modern world. I mean, if the church didn't exist, I wouldn't even know that Jesus existed. I wouldn't even have the Bible. So it's so important to stop and think to yourself, what does it mean to be human? Why does it matter? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> right? Um, it's so important to understand that you are unique and that your desire to seek the truth is what it means to be human. Okay? The we'll talk about human nature in a minute. But the desire to know the truth is distinctly human. There is no other species on this planet that seeks the truth the way that a human being does. And we're talking both objective and subjective truths, right? Quantitative and qualitative truths. We're talking no other species on this planet seeks scientific truth or philosophical truth. No other species on this planet seeks religious truth or spiritual truth. We are the only creatures on this planet, number one, that want to do it, and number two, have the ability to do it. And by it, I mean seek the truth. So when we're talking about truth, what are we, what do we mean? What do I mean? 
I'm going to, I guess, recall, ask you to recall the last video that you watched um, that outlined qualitative truths versus quantitative truths. Um, to make things easier, remember qualitative truths are things that cannot be touched or are not tangible. Quantitative truths are tangible items that can be touched. So if we want to make this easier, you can sometimes say that qualitative truths involve faith, some, if that's, you know, sometimes, and then quantitative truths involve reason. So let's look at this analogy or look at this little picture here. Um, you have the triangle at the top, and that is, you should remember from your freshman year, God, okay, just a little image of God, the Trinity. God is perfect, right? God would not contradict himself. God would not lie to you. God would not play jokes on you. Okay, God is perfect, right? The Trinity, the um, relationship, the perfect relationship of three persons, the Trinity, remember? Um, God is the source of everything that exists. Everything. So when we're talking about human beings seeking truth, we are talking about human beings seeking truth that God reveals. Anything that is true, anything, anything that is true comes from God. I'm going to say that again. Anything that is true, anything that exists that is true comes from God. So there are so many people out there who try to say, well, you know, God is the, the source of the Bible and that's it. No, that's not true. God is the author of the universe. God is the author of physics. God is the author of calculus. God is the author of geometry. God is the author of, you know, true philosophy. God is the author of true religion, i.e. Jesus Christ. So anything that is true comes from God. Anything. Okay? So you cannot say that, oh, you know, I'm going to leave my religion and leave it out of my politics or leave it out of my, of, you know, my, my beliefs about, about government. That's not true. That anything that is true comes from God. Anything, say that, I'm going to keep saying that. You need to know this for the test and for your life in general. Anything that is true comes from God because God is truth itself. God is truth itself. And any truth that we know comes from God as the source. So faith and reason are both gifts from God, directly from God. So faith, divine revelation, the Bible, the life of Jesus Christ, um, apostolic tradition, those are truths that come from God. Reason, human pursuit, um, logic, philosophy, science, math, all of these things come from God as well. So um, if you look at the PowerPoint, it says both flow, so both faith and reason flow from the same source and do not actually contradict each other because they come from the same source, which is God. So in an ideal world or in a perfect world, faith and reason would never contradict, ever. I'm going to let that sink in. In a perfect world, faith and reason would never contradict each other. Clearly, or I'm, I'm hoping that you think that you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, well, aren't there times when religion and science disagree, right? If there is a situation where faith and reason disagree or contradict each other, or it seems like they contradict each other, then someone is incorrect. Sometimes there are situations where people in certain religions have been incorrect. There have been many times when people in certain scientific fields have been incorrect as well. So when I'm going to try to get you to come out of or to get rid of this understanding or drop this understanding that faith and reason do not belong together. That if you're a scientist, you can't be religious. And if you're religious, you can't be a scientist. I'm trying to get that, get you away from that thinking. Um, that that is in, that's an incorrect way to think about the world. That faith and reason are both true because they come from God who is the source of truth and, and who is truth itself. So when faith and reason don't agree with each other, one or both of them are incorrect. That is a test question, so make sure you write that down. When faith and reason do not agree with each other, one or both of them are incorrect. So let's try to come up with some examples. When have there been situations when faith, people of faith have been wrong about truth itself? 
Maybe think about people who murder other human beings in the name of religion. I can think of, you know, some radical religious people who murder other people because they said God told them to do it or because they want, you know, if you if you aren't going to be Catholic, we're going, we're going to kill you. If someone ever said something like that, that's that's incorrect. OK, that that's not a correct way to believe. There are other people of religion who um, are people of faith who believe that um, dinosaurs didn't exi don't exist because they, they don't appear in the Bible, in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. That is incorrect. That's an incorrect way or statement, and that's an incorrect way to believe or something to, that is incorrect because we have very clear evidence that dinosaurs have existed, <laughs> okay, that dinosaurs existed long before we did. Um, that there, we have reason to believe that. And just because Genesis doesn't discuss dinosaurs, that doesn't mean that dinosaurs are fake. But I have actually, believe it or not, met people who have told, met one person who has told me, no, dinosaurs are fake. They're, they're made up by, by scientists. And that's not true. Dinosaurs existed. Um, there, so in that situation, the person, that person of faith is incorrect. That person has misunderstood his or her faith. So there are other times when faith is correct and reason or, you know, human pursuit is wrong. So um, I'm trying to find something that's not controversial, but it's very difficult when you're talking about ethics. Um, I'm going to take the abortion, you know, argument. And I understand it's controversial. We'll get to it later. It's okay. Don't get upset. But it is a very clear one of it is very very clear in church teaching that abortion is not morally permissible it is very clear teaching you cannot um you're not morally allowed to have an abortion obviously no one's going to hunt you down okay if you do but it's just the the church teaches that a, that a human life is human life from the moment of conception to the moment of death and actually, believe it or not, John Paul coined that phrase. So, um, you, um, the, let's see, respect of human life from conception to natural death. Um, sorry, little tidbit, side note. But there are some people who say, well, it's not really a human being until it's born. That's incorrect. That is an incorrect scientific statement that it is always a human being, or at least always a human being in a different developmental form in the womb. So faith, our faith tells us that abortion is wrong. Therefore, our science should also tell, should also be able to investigate when human life begins and tell us, oh, no, this is a human being. But for some reason, because abortion is so popular in, our, in you know, in our current generation, um, there are scientists out there who say, well, I don't know when human life begins. Uh, I don't know. Which is silly. Science has the ability to determine what is human life and when human life begins, but there are some scientists who refuse to do that. So um, that's a situation or that's an example of, the, of a time when human pursuit or human reason has contradicted faith and human reason is incorrect. So this is a very important truth to understand that faith and reason do not contradict themselves each other. And when they do, someone is incorrect. It could be a person of faith or it could be a person of reason. But if they do not agree with each other, faith and reason, if they do not agree, one is incorrect. So based on the truth uh, from the previous slide that God is the source of all truth itself, John Paul argues that Reason and faith cannot be separated without diminishing the capacity of men and women to know themselves, the world, and God in an appropriate way. That's in section 16. That's the paragraph with the number 16 in front of it. And then in section 17, he says, there is no reason for competition of any kind between reason and faith. Each contains the other, and each has its own scope for action. So reason contains faith. Faith contains reason, and they both have an equal, equally important role in human existence and the human ability to know the truth. So now let's discuss human nature itself, and this is extremely important. This is something you will have to remember and know for the rest of your time here in theology, um, that the desire to know is distinctly human, as I told you um, a few slides ago. 
And also, the desire to know is an indication of your human nature. It is part of what you are. It is how you are built, okay? You are created by God to come to know the truth by using both faith and reason. So this is what's called your rational nature. So on the test and on every single test where I, I may actually ask you this many, many, many times in a test, over the course of the rest of the year, I'm going to ask you, what kind of nature do you have as a human being? Or what kind of nature does a human being have? The answer is rational nature. I'm going to say that again. Human nature is rational nature. Please do not ever forget that. Write that down, circle it, highlight it, underline it. It's so important. Rational nature. So what does rational nature mean? It means what I've already said. It means that you have the ability to seek the truth. You have the ability to utilize both faith and reason, both qualitative and quantitative truths to seek the truth. You have the ability to use qualitative and quantitative truths to seek the truth of, human, of existence itself. You also have the desire to know the truth. You also have the desire to know the truth. John Paul quotes St. Augustine when John Paul says, I have met many who wanted to deceive, but none who wanted to be deceived. I have met many who wanted to deceive, but none who wanted to be deceived. And I always um, kind of laugh about this or laugh about this phrase because it's so true that how many people out there do you know how many people out there are trying to persuade someone else to buy something, right? How many people out there are trying to persuade you to buy something? How many times have you been lied to? How many times has, you know, has something on Facebook lied to you or something on Instagram? How many times has, oh, one of my favorite, you know, articles to look at are those article or read are those articles that point out how fake Instagram pictures are, how, you know, how many thousands of dollars celebrities spend to get the perfect Instagram picture. So you think that everything is nice and perfect and pretty um, in their lives, but that's not really what's happening, that it's actually taking thousands of dollars and hours of taking pictures to come up with the perfect Instagram photo. So how many people have been, have wanted, are wanting to deceive others, right? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. There are so many people out there who always want to deceive other people. But no one wants to be deceived. No one wants to be lied to. I mean, think to yourself um, how upset you get when you find out someone lies to you. Or if you find out someone's talking about you behind your back, you get really upset and you, you want to know exactly what's said about you, right? Well, if you're a girl, I mean, guys, I don't know how guys handle it, but if you're a girl, <laughs> okay, you want to know exactly what was said, who was there when it was said, you know, why nobody told you about it until now, you know, like you want to know the truth. And that is part of your human nature. And guys want to know the truth a different way. Okay, they're not as um, aggressive as girls are sometimes, but they have their own way of seeking truth. So each person, even if you want to deceive other people, even if you're someone who's a liar, you don't want anybody to lie to you. And that's part of your human nature. So take or think about yourself and think about your experience as a human. And so far, think about how you don't want anyone to lie to you, right? You don't want your teachers to lie to you. You don't want your parents to lie to you. You don't want, you know, your friends to lie to you, your boyfriend or your girlfriend to lie to you. You don't want that. And that's part of what it means to be human. That is an indication of your rational human nature. So now this brings us to the fool. John Paul discusses the fool in section 18. Um, first, he says that there are three rules of seeking truth. Human knowledge is a journey which allows no rest, meaning um, we can never come to the end of knowledge, that there's always more that we do not know. The path of knowledge is not for the proud, who think that everything is the fruit of personal conquest, and one must always be humble and recognize God's governance of the world. Now I'm going to continue reading in section 18, but it's the last paragraph in section 18. It's not on the PowerPoint. John Paul says that in abandoning these rules, the human being runs the risk of failure and ends up in the condition of the fool. For the Bible, in this foolishness, there lies a threat to life. The fool thinks he knows many things, but really, 
he is incapable of fixing his gaze on the things that truly matter. Therefore, he can neither order his mind nor assume a correct attitude to himself or to the world around him. So if you are a fool, and now I'm not reading John Paul anymore, sorry, this is my commentary. If you are a fool, you do not have the ability to understand your own value or the value of the world around you. So you are a fool if you ignore faith, and you are also a fool if you ignore reason or logic. You need both. And if you cannot have both, or if you do not seek both in your life, or accept both as equally important in your life, then you do not have the ability to understand who you are as a human being, and to know your own value, and you also do not have the ability to know the value of the world around you. As a human being with rational nature, you have the obligation to seek the truth. I will say that again. You have the obligation to seek the truth. This means that it is absolutely necessary to seek the truth. You have to do it. <laughs> you do not have a choice. It is not something that um, you can either decide to do or not do. You must seek the truth. John Paul says that although each individual has a right to be respected in his own journey in search of the truth, there exists a prior moral obligation and a grave one at that to seek the truth and to adhere to it once it's known. So this is where I have this little, um, this little arrow here. So I have truth on one side and action on the other. It should be pretty easy to figure out. Truth leads to action, right? So what you believe to be true will will lead you to act. So let's think about that for a second. If I believe that it is extremely important to protect the environment and that the environment is so valuable and essential to human life, what kinds of things will I do if I believe that the environment is important? I will recycle, right? I will turn off the lights when I'm not using them. I will... Um, save gas by maybe owning a hybrid, which I do, I do have a hybrid, um, or I will save gas by riding with, to school with, you know, my coworkers or, um, or my friends. If you live near someone who go, goes to St. Pius, maybe ride to school together to save gas. Um, so save on, you know, carbon emissions, that sort of thing. So if I believe that saving the environment is important, I'm going to do things to try to save the environment, right? If I believe that um, racism is wrong, how am I going to act? Hopefully, I will treat everyone I meet with dignity and respect. Hopefully, okay? Um, so what you believe to be true will lead to your action. This is why it is so important to seek the truth and to adhere to the truth once you know it. This is why you have an obligation to seek the truth because your actions change based on what you know to be true. So if you know that the environment is important and that the environment is special, you will behave a certain way. If you know that racism is wrong and that every human being has human dignity, you will treat humans a certain way once you know this truth. That's why it's so important for you to know the truth, seek the truth, and adhere to it once you know the truth. So, okay, we just heard quite a bit of information. So let's try to figure out what this means for morality. Or what does this mean for proper human behavior or ethics? Because this is the subject of the class. What does all of this information mean for the way that I should live my life? So your actions will be based on what you believe to be true, right? So what is the problem here? Clearly people have different understandings or different ideas of the truth. Otherwise, we would all behave the exact same way, right? And we'd all have the same opinions and we'd all be exactly the same, right? Yes. Okay, so clearly there's a problem, right? So there's a problem here because we don't all behave the same way and we don't all have the same opinions. We have very different opinions. If you ask someone um, or people off the street about abortion, you'll probably have half of the people say one opinion and the other half say another opinion. So how do we fix this? 
this problem that we're discussing or that we I mentioned in the previous slide can be fixed once we understand that there is such a thing as universal truth. So let's, I'll, I'll get to universal truth in a second, but let's talk about the fact that truth exists. How do we know that truth exists? The desire for truth is an inherent human characteristic. The desire would not exist if it could not be satiated, much like hunger or thirst, okay? So if you, if water did not exist, or you're, if the ability to drink did not exist, you would not get thirsty. If the ability to eat food did not exist, you would not get hungry. You would not want to eat food. So what, what does that mean? What does that mean for my behavior and everyone's behavior? So who cares, right? Why does this matter? This matters because John Paul and many, many, many of the great thinkers, okay, in history have argued that there is such a thing as universal truth. And this is in paragraph tw or section 27 in Fides et Ratio. John Paul says, every truth, if it is really true, presents itself as universal. If something is true, then it must be true for all people and at all times. So if something is true, it is true for all people in all places and at all times. This is universal truth. So if racism, let's go back to the racism comment. If racism is wrong, racism is always wrong for all people in all places and at all times. And there are no excuses and no exceptions. If racism is truly wrong, it is never acceptable to be racist. It is always wrong to be racist. So let's say two plus two. Two plus two is four. Two plus two is four today. Two plus two equaled four 2,000 years ago. Two plus two will equal four 2,000 years from now. It will never change, just like moral truths. So good morality, if you look at the bottom of the slide, good morality or good human behavior or good human actions, good morality is based on an action's adherence to universal truth. So your actions, if your actions are good, that means that they adhere to that which is universally true. And we will talk about universal truth extensively in the next unit. But this is what you need to understand now is that there is such a thing as universal truth, things that are true for all people in all places and at all times. And your behavior, in order for your behavior to be good behavior or good morality, it must be based on that which is universally true for all people in all places and at all times. So what did we learn? What are we supposed to learn or what were we supposed to figure out from this PowerPoint? Number one, faith and reason are not enemies. Faith and reason flow from the same source and never contradict each other. Number two, what you believe will be, tr what you believe is true will affect your moral actions or affect your behavior. So what you believe to be true will affect your behavior. Number three, morality is not a set of rules made by random old men at the Vatican. <laughs> um, and I didn't explicitly say this over the course of the last couple of um, slides, but it's something that you should have been able to, to grasp or read between the lines. Morality is not a set of rules made by random old men at the Vatican, okay? Morality or the moral code um, helps us, helps human beings live more closely to that which is universally true. So morality or the church's moral code allows human beings to more closely follow that which is universally true. So think about it, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is a code that allows us to live more closely to that which is universally true. The Ten Commandments just happen to come from God, okay? Um, but they also allow, if we follow the Ten Commandments, it allows us to adhere to that which is universally true for all human beings. So I have this little blurb here. Can we talk more about universal truth? Yes. 
How do we know what universal truth is? Okay, that is the next unit. We will discuss universal truth extensively in the next unit and honestly the rest of the year. So don't stress out about what this universal truth is or what we can know universally or all of the truths that we can universally know. Do not worry about that. All you need to worry about for this particular video is these three items that I have on this slide. So enjoy.